Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of Cannabis Unlocked. I'm your host, Jordan Euclid, one of the founding partners of Key Investment Partners. And today I'm joined by my friend Judson Hill. Judson, how are you today? I'm great. I appreciate you having me, Jordan. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate you joining the show. I love the uh, polo with the cannabis leaf, you know, a little, little uh, fun, a little work, right? <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. It's um actually a Japanese maple leaf to be exact, but um, it's it's a brand called Boast. It's uh, an old like 70s tennis brand. Um, Tommy Hilfiger actually acquired the license to it. And then long story short, my buddy Los who's in the cannabis industry out in California. Um, he's launching it as a cannabis brand. So wow. it's a cool uh, play on a, a old school uh, reference to cannabis pretty indiscreetly. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it. What'd you say the brand was called? It's called Boast. Okay. B-O-A-S-T. But like Arthur Ashe and all used to wear it back in the 70s. Jimmy Connor uh, yeah. playing tennis. Wow, that's really interesting. And I know we just kind of got got into it, but um, Judson, why don't we take a step back and uh, it would be great if you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself, your biographical work, um, and how you got into the cannabis industry. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, I mean, great timing. I'm actually here in Atlanta today, which is where I was born and raised. So um, there's a new cannabis scene coming along here in Georgia, but obviously uh, in terms of my career, uh, moved out to California pretty soon after college. Um, before cannabis, I worked mostly in startups in the e-commerce and fashion and apparel space, and really just was passionate about cannabis. Started to see a market develop, being the uh, the early medical market uh, back in like 2012, 2013, and was just a customer trying to figure out how I could get into the industry. Never really saw a career in cannabis at first but then I started to see some of the analogs between the fashion and apparel industry and cannabis I would say um, being you know it went from people selling packs of weed across the country to how can I brand and get my product into retail um, conveniently had a client when I was still in the fashion space who was involved in the uh, traditional market I'd say come to us and ask us if we could help them brand um, brand is weed was making uh blunts called tuna rolls mm -hmm. and long story short that was my first uh foray that was probably 2016 it was maybe a little before its time but then i started uh -huh. poking around and uh figuring out how i could really get involved in the uh, legal market hmm. can we still find tuna rolls anywhere no we cannot um, <laughs> it, it's it's a sad story but um that was, that was a not above board operation. It was a traditional 2016 and they didn't really have uh, all the pieces in place to take off. So I guess from there, it just had my mind thinking. Um, fortunately, I was living in LA, uh, pretty much the center of the cannabis industry at that time. Mm -hmm. I would say um, I got connected um, to Casa Verde Capital, which is mm -hmm. obviously another VC in the space and ended up working in a few of their portfolio companies, uh, always headed up the uh, sales and business development, as that's really what my background was. Um, with the first uh, first company I worked with called Trellis, it was an inventory management ERP solution uh, integrated to metric. Uh, again, this was all before 2018. So it was the interesting Hey, so uh, we just lost connection there for a second, but Judson, you were talking about your time at Trellis, so maybe we can take it back from there. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so, I mean, I was saying Trellis was an uh, inventory management solution for operators uh, to basically make metric easier to interact with. And for anyone that's in the industry, I mean, metric is the compliance tool that most states use to enter all your uh, seed to sale information from cultivation all the way down to retail. Again, this was pre-2018, so it was all hypothetical, making it even more confusing. And metric is really a government database, I would say, not a actionary tool for operators. So point being, the data isn't really useful in metric alone. Uh, Trellis was a great way to give our clients actionable items uh, all right, so third time's the charm. Uh, what were you saying about Trellis? Uh, just explaining, uh, 
uh, hypothetical software tool, I guess, at the time. But what we were doing was uh, providing an interface for operators to enter their compliant information into our system that then submitted it to metric. Metric is obviously the government compliance system in California is what we were talking about at the time and has since been uh, the state regulated program for most uh, legal, medical and uh, recreational states. Unfortunately, metric doesn't really provide you with much valuable insights or uh, dashboards for the operators. So everything from POS to in the case of Trellis, um, more up the supply chain for manufacturers and cultivators. It's really a way to uh, optimize that data and uh, allow the operators to be compliant, but also see useful insights into their business um, was really what we were building at Trellis. And for me, it was a great way to network and meet all of the legal operators uh, in California originally, since everyone either had to use our system or a similar one, I uh, really was able to build my network and uh, learn who was coming into the market, I guess, the right way if you're using a compliance system. Gotcha. Very, uh, very helpful. And so, um, you know, that uh, that company unfortunately didn't make it as many in cannabis have not. So, you know, how was that experience like? And, you know, what is what has been your, you know, the... How has it been, you know, seeing seeing those ebbs and flows in the cannabis industries, the high highs and the low lows? Uh, yeah, no, I mean, that's a great topic for that. And I guess it did make it probably not the way we would have liked to. Um, to the ebbs and flows point, this was, you know, 2017, 2018. So we were yeah. really at the peak of money flowing into the industry and people being excited. Um, we actually did have a great offer for a Series A in 2019, we ended up going the route of a potential merger into a company that's still around and most people are probably familiar with called Tilt. Um, Tilt now is an operator on the East Coast, but they've pivoted numerous times where it first went public as a combination of Baker, which was a customer loyalty software uh, out of Denver. Um, I actually worked from their offices for almost six months. It was that complete of a deal. Uh, anyways, Trellis ended up not being a part of that. And, uh, we did say, um, we were acquired by MJ Freeway, which is a Kerna. So to the point it does exist, um, publicly traded company now, a Kerna, uh, was a competitor of ours. So probably not the way that we would have desired it. And to yeah. your point, there was peaks and valleys, um, but definitely has been a interesting, learning curve. And I, I had left Trellis uh, prior to the Akerna acquisition. So I wasn't around. I kind of saw the writing on the wall there to some degree. And also I was more passionate about the brand side, to be honest. I mean, my background uh -huh. in fashion and apparel startups prior to cannabis. Mm -hmm. So I had joined a company that I'm still a partner in called Higgs. Um, so that's pre-rolls. My friend had started in the uh, traditional medical market in California. Yeah. I helped take it into the legal market via a licensing deal. This was back in 2018. So, I mean, really learned a lot from, I guess, Trellis was helpful to know who the licensed operators were early on. We partnered up with a group out of LA that made our pre-rolls. And then since then, we've launched into Colorado and Michigan most recently via an asset light licensing model. So, uh, I guess, to the point of Trellis and the transitions of the industry as a whole, uh, you got to be adaptable. And uh, yeah. in that case, I moved on to the operator side, which then eventually led to me working for another uh, ancillary company where I was the second team member at a company called Bespoke Financial, which was the first lender uh, specific to the industry doing working capital lines of credit and factoring mostly, which again, there I had really learned the lesson the hard way from my time on the operator where we were selling Higgs into retailers in 2018 you think you have a sale and then 30 days later um, you're waiting for the retailer to pay you, which doesn't always happen. Or even if it does happen in 30 days, uh, there's a long cash flow conversion cycle. Mm -hmm. So I was very familiar with the issue and um, it was actually really exciting to start Bespoke where we work to solve that problem for operators by providing them a working capital solution uh, similar to what any other normal business would get from a line of credit at a bank. Yeah, 
Yeah, no, and that's actually when you were bespoke is when we first connected. And apologies for my uh, misstating on on trellis. Um, but yeah, that's that's great to. Um, it's all good. It was uh, <laughs> again um, not not a headline grabber in terms of uh, the, the acquisition, but it it is still existing, I guess, via via Kerner stock. Uh huh. Uh huh. That's right. And you know that's um. Uh, as you talk about, you know, specialty finance, that's a place that we've seen in cannabis, you know, continue to be one of, if not the biggest challenge for, for companies across uh, the industry, right, is just getting access to capital. So I'm curious to get your thoughts, you know, having seen uh, the insides of a number of cannabis companies and also helping on the fundraising side, like what has the uh, the lack of access to capital throughout the last six years, like what has that how has that impacted the industry? Yeah, no, I mean, to your point, a lot of companies were well-funded out of the gate, and then a lot of them didn't use that money very wisely. Also, a lot of operators, I'd say, were a bit overly confident, where they thought if they had the money to get up and running, then you'd just be printing cash. I think anyone that's been in the industry the past few years knows for a variety of reasons from taxes and regulations and what have you, uh, not many people are printing cash yet. So you need working capital to continue your business. And that's pretty standard for any industry. Um, a lot of what I did at first when I joined Bespoke was again, similar to Trellis in the point of there, we were educating operators on why you need compliant uh, software. This was why do you need debt financing? Because historically there was either no debt financing in cannabis or it was more of, you know, kind of a, a loan shark up in Humboldt County providing someone uh, some sketchy loan. So we had to teach the operators, you know, how you could use the working capital to your advantage. Um, again, help with the cash flow conversion. And uh, when I'd say Bespoke really was onto something was when we started doing inventory financing which is really the, the converse of factory, not to get too deep in the weeds, but factoring would be advancing on the receivables. Inventory financing, we started advancing payment directly to our clients' vendors, allowing them to purchase both bulk cannabis products. So let's say you're a pre-roll company, you need to buy weed, you need to buy cones to put the pre-rolls in, packs. We would pay all of our clients' vendors so they could bring that uh, product in, make their product, make their sale, and then repay us on terms really allowed a lot of companies to scale up. Um, and I'd say a great example of that would be uh, my good friends over at Jeter, mm -hmm. which is, um, you know, the number one pre-roll brand in the country and would be a testament to what happens when you have working capital on hand to rapidly scale uh, to meet that demand. Yep. Yep. I mean, it's so critical, uh, especially as you say, as you're, as you're scaling up, um, because th those working capital demands just become such a drain on your cash, right? And, you know, in an industry where cash is incredibly hard to come by, that can be a huge bottleneck to growth and, and has been for many folks. Um, now, I wanted to go back to uh, something you mentioned earlier about, you know, your past in apparel and um, fashion. And, you know, would love to get your thoughts on the importance of cannabis and fashion, right? And, and I think, uh, Kind of another interesting connection point for us is obviously our connection through the um, TRP company. Uh, you introduced us to, to that company who we had subsequently invested in. And obviously the cookies brand um, could arguably be, it could be arguably said that, you know, the apparel piece of that has been the most important part of them becoming, you know, what many would consider the most well-known brand within cannabis. So anyway, we'd just love to get your thoughts on kind of the connection between cannabis and apparel broadly. A hundred percent. I mean, I, I guess to what I was saying originally, I mean, that was really the genesis of my personal uh, journey into cannabis, where I saw the need to brand the product, get it into retail stores, which is what I was doing more in the luxury apparel market, selling into, you know, the likes of Barney's and things of that nature. To your point on cookies, like would totally agree it's the most recognizable brand in the industry by far, whether people love it or hate it or somewhere in between, everyone knows cookies. And I'd say they've done a great job with that apparel and um, just with the way they've been able to connect to the culture. Mm -hmm. uh, I think brands are the future of cannabis. And I think a lot of people thought that, which is why there's probably way too many brands in most mature markets right now. 
And unfortunately, it's just that the consumer, I uh, don't think is to the point of having a brand loyalty for an overgeneralization, but most people walk into a dispensary, they're asking the bud tender what to get, or they're asking, you know, what's the cheapest product available under, you know, the specific medium they're looking for. Uh, it's really hard at this point to distinguish yourself as a brand, I would say, because of, I mean, everything from uh, marketing and advertising regulations where you can't really target consumers in the same way or advertise a brand. Um, the pricing is obviously a key issue, but like you said, Cookies has done a great job of using the apparel. Uh, like they have the a flagship location now in uh, you know New York City that's mostly just apparel only, mm -hmm. up to my understanding, definitely yeah. mm -hmm. THC cannabis. And I mean, almost to the point where you can go into any gas station across America, or at least in California where I live, and you'll see some knockoff cookies, um, which probably isn't going directly to them, but in, to your point is building that you know, brand recognition, yeah. which I commend them for. And uh, yeah, I mean, the, the TRP team is a group that I'm really close and fond with. I mean, my personal bias is my girlfriend is also in the industry and she's worked closely with the uh, Cookies Retail TRP team. Mm -hmm. I'm good friends with uh, Dan and Brandon and I love what they're building and kind of more the real estate play that they've gone about to expand out the footprint of the Cookies Retail locations. And then uh, again, my personal bias of the South, I know they've taken a big stake in Florida um, which I think is an exciting market. So definitely. Yeah, really yeah, absolutely. And, you know, as you talk about where you're from in the South and a lot of the projects you're working on right now, I mean, tell us about what are some of the new markets that are getting you excited for cannabis going forward? Yeah, no, I mean, my focus has been, I'd say almost fully on the East Coast uh, since I left Bespoke uh, mid last year, where I really saw the opportunity as, you know, I have a strong network within the industry of operators. And then also on the capital side, as you mentioned, both with debt and equity providers, what I didn't have was connection with the decision makers. So uh, here in Atlanta, um, my dad was a longtime Georgia state Senator. Never thought I'd be working with him on anything cannabis related, but hmm. uh, here we are. Cannabis falls under healthcare and my dad headed up the healthcare committee in Georgia. So helped write the original medical marijuana legislation in Georgia, um, probably six or seven years back. And we don't even have legal sales yet. So it shows how slow things can move. Um, but anyways, I saw the opportunity of getting involved in these East coast markets, um, you know, where I have projects all the way up to Massachusetts. Um, Canapreneur Partners is the firm where I'm at right now. Um, we're building out a retail footprint and extraction and manufacturing facility in mass. Uh, I also have projects that I worked on with my dad in Mississippi, uh, which is a state I never thought I'd be too excited about. I mean, I'm from the South, but I'm not uh, traveling to Mississippi often. They have done a great job, though, of rolling out a program quickly uh, that has pretty open conditions for patients. So they have a large uh, patient base, or at least they have the potential for a large patient base based on what qualifies. And you can do all types of form factors being, you know, vape smokables. So it's really like a, a California was back in the medical day of really uh, similar to a recreational market, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of larger, more exciting opportunities from an investment standpoint, I, I like Florida a lot. Um, Clearly, it's been around for a while. It was more of an oligopoly of sorts with mm -hmm. truly being the uh, the large player in the space, but they are issuing another round of licenses um, currently. Uh, those are due at the end of April, and many think that this is the last chance to organically apply for one of these medical licenses versus have to purchase one. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, really just interesting dynamics, I would say, across the whole East Coast and Southeast particularly of getting involved early and how exactly you can go about that. Because again, to the case of Florida, truly has a ballot measure that they're pushing forward right now that would legalize uh, recreational next year. Um, at first glance, that sounds awesome, but the the unique prerogative is obviously that it would only grandfather in the existing medical operators. So you really kind of have to know 
the minutia of each market in terms of when to get in. And then I guess connecting it back to working with my dad on it. Um, he works now in the private sector doing mostly government affairs, lobbying work for traditional healthcare companies. But again, it's the same people making the laws for the medical marijuana program. So he's doing a lot of government affairs work uh, mm -hmm. and pretty plugged in at the regulatory level. Um, so kind of helpful to have that track plus the uh, operational knowledge and uh, capital side that I provide. Sure. Wow, that's great. And so, uh, you know, talking about Canapreneur and, and the Massachusetts markets, it's obviously had its fair share of ups and downs as well. So what are things looking like in the market today? Have you seen... Um, pricing kind of bottom out on the wholesale front or, you know, how, how, uh, how are, is your assessment of that market overall today? Um, yeah, no, I mean, you, you nailed it in terms of kind of where it's headed. What excites me about Massachusetts and about Canapanor in particular is um, our CEO and founder. Uh, this is his second venture in cannabis where he founded one of the first verticals in mass uh, had a pretty large exit in 2021 where that company was acquired by Jushi for a little over a hundred million dollars. So uh, has a track record of success would be the first to tell you the opportunity there was being a first mover, kind of like mm -hmm. I was talking about the Southern States. Now where I think the opportunity in Massachusetts is, is really bringing in quality product and brands because not specific diss to Massachusetts, but the East coast is not really known for fire weed or the best branding. Um, I think if you bring really operators from the Colorados, the California, the best in class operators and plant them in the more fertile grounds of these East Coast markets, that's an exciting opportunity to me. And that's really what we're building at Canapanor uh, is a retail footprint along with extraction and manufacturing. Because um, to your point, you're alluded to the flower pricing is starting to collapse like most mature markets. Uh, I think the opportunity is really to use flour as a commodity. Um, we're looking to make live resin, live rosin. So really a higher quality differentiated oil, which is where, you know, California, Colorado, more mature markets have trended to. So then we can provide a unique product with our input cost being low and really own the, uh, brand sector via our extraction and manufacturing facility mm -hmm. and then own the consumer uh, via our retail. So that's uh, really the play in Massachusetts that we're working on. And I think what's exciting in these East Coast markets is, you know, first you get up and running, but then actually bringing that quality product and branding um, yeah. to markets is kind of the second wave. Yeah, that makes total sense. You know, and it's, it's interesting to see, uh, the brands segment evolve as well, right? I mean, definitely there are ones that have separated themselves more from the pack, I think, and, and you know, established more of a national presence. Um, and there's a lot that, you know, have have gotten hit by those same ups and downs of the markets and those same access to capital. And, and so uh, it's interesting, you know, we definitely came into the industry thinking that brands was going to be one of the first places where we, where we went um, with a lot of investments. And then we actually have, have, been more cautious about deploying in that space just because, uh, you know, it's been hard for folks to really establish that staying power. Yeah. I mean, I, like, I guess with the various uh, experiences I've had in cannabis, some, a lot of firsthand lessons learned, but yeah, I mean, same thing on Higgs, the pre-roll brand that I'm a partner in. Again, we did a licensing deal back in 2018. So one of the first to go with more of the white label asset light uh, licensing structures and the th thought process was the same. It allows you to scale quickly, to be you know nimble and not tied to a lot of uh, capex. But to your point, um, you know there hasn't been as much brand loyalty yet, and also just with all of the uh, intricacies of the supply chain. I think when you don't own your own supply chain, um, it's hard to take priority. Mm -hmm. And then looping it back to the bespoke concept and the AR issue across the industry, um, if retailers aren't paying the operator that they purchased the product from, then let me tell you the last person to get paid then is the brand that is partnered with the operator that hasn't gotten paid. So you want to talk about a long cash conversion cycle. Um, it can be very difficult when you're not the operator and you're kind of the last man to uh, collect that money. So yeah. one of the difficulties on the uh, straight brand play, I would say. 
Yep, that makes sense. Wow. Well, Judson, thank you so much for uh, coming on the show. I love talking to you as always. Um, are there uh, opportunities that um, people in Massachusetts should look into if they're interested in learning more about Canapreneur or um, are you guys hiring? Anything like that? Yeah, I mean, definitely on the Canapreneur front, I mean, to be transparent and cut to the chase, we're definitely raising capital for the extraction and manufacturing facility. So anyone that is interested in a build out to bring in uh, more higher quality extraction, some experienced operators and brands from the West Coast and plant them into the East Coast. That's what we're working on along with building out our retail footprint. Mm -hmm. uh, also, we have three locations. So any brands that are interested in getting in our stores, the uh, chain name is called Joint Operations. Would love to talk there. And then again, um, in the South down here, my dad has a couple of interesting projects, both uh, Florida and Texas, particularly, which we didn't talk as much about, but um, very excited about Texas. They're in the process of issuing uh, licenses for their medical program. And they also just added chronic pain uh, to the patient conditions. So I think Texas, I mean, 30 million people, there's going to be under 10 licenses. That's a huge opportunity and uh, yeah. something that I'm excited about as well. Yeah, we are definitely very excited about Texas as well. Awesome. Well, you know, I appreciate you having me. And again, I think the East Coast, and in my opinion, the Southeast is really the last frontier of uh, yet to be tapped into markets where you can be a first mover. And uh, there's the Floridas, there's the Texas, and then I'm sitting here in Georgia. So one day the program will come around and uh, I can guarantee you people in Atlanta like to smoke weed. So I think that will be a great market as well. Absolutely. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks again, Judson. Cool. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Take care.